Have you ever looked at the disgusting treatment of George Floyd by American police officers and wondered, why are American police so racist? Why won't this problem go away for America? After America was discovered, it needed people to help build an economy that today rivals the world. In 1619, a Dutch ship brought one of the first 20 odd African slaves to the shores of America. Although it is thought, captive Africans had already been in what would become the United States since 1526. For almost four centuries, this country, this region that we know today as Angola, was heavily involved in these activities, and this country was harmed in every single aspect. The social fabric was destroyed, and today, we live with the consequences of slavery. Centuries of colonial rule, combined with slavery, fostered conflicts in Africa that increased poverty and instability, Fortuna says. The slave trade destabilized African societies. It wasn't possible during the times of slavery and colonization for African societies to reorganize their political and labor systems. And sometimes, people try to forget this part of the country's history. Some historians have estimated that 6 to 7 million enslaved people were imported to the New World during the 18th century alone, depriving the African continent of its most valuable resource, its healthiest and ablest men and women. In 1776, one in six colonists was an African American, and of those, 99% were slaves. Most lived in the southern colonies. But New York and New Jersey also had large slave populations. When the revolution began, African Americans reacted with hope and excitement. Many were equally ecstatic about the words of the Declaration of Independence, which declared that all men are created equal. As the brutality of the war intensified, many British officers began viewing runaway slaves as contraband, that is, goods to be seized and confiscated. Sadly, thousands were sold into an even worse form of slavery in the West Indies, with greedy British officers making as much as $1,000 for each slave that they sold. In spite of the arguments and turmoil, the service of African Americans changed the minds of many white Americans. By the end of the war, Vermont, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire had abolished slavery. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson made cautious steps towards limiting slavery in the newly independent nation. However, the Constitution also acknowledged the institution, guaranteeing the right to repossess any persons held to service or labour, an obvious euphemism for slavery. Many northern states had abolished slavery by the end of the 18th century, but the institution was absolutely vital to the South where blacks constituted a large majority of the population and the economy relied on the production of crops like tobacco and cotton. Congress outlawed the import of new enslaved people in 1808, but the enslaved population in the US nearly tripled over the next 50 years, and by 1860 it had reached nearly 4 million, with more than half living in the cotton-producing states of the South. In, in, in 1776, uh, most people did not have a racial explanation for slavery. That is to say, they had no biological uh, explanation. Um, they simply thought of slavery, they took, most people took slavery prior to the revolution, most people took slavery for granted. Slavery had existed for thousands of years, going back to the ancient Greeks and even before, and, and had existed for all that time without substantial criticism. So it's the revolution, the enlightenment, that creates a problem that makes slavery a problem and people suddenly realize they have to justify it. Now where they where it could be abandoned and, and abolished in the northern states it was and people got rid of it. But in the south uh, it was just too deeply entrenched in their society and therefore they had to defend it, justify it. They never had to do do that before. It was never a peculiar institution. It was just another gradation in a society of various uh, statuses or ranks of unfreedom. And people didn't think of slavery as, as being as conspicuous as it became with the revolution. 
Once you begin talking about liberty, equality, then slavery becomes a real problem. And in order to justify slavery, Southerners began falling back on racial explanations. So in some peculiar way, uh, not only did the revolution create an anti-slave movement, but it also created racism in America. In the years after the American Revolution, South America faced an economic crisis. The soil used to grow tobacco, then the leading cash crop, was exhausted, while products such as rice and indigo failed to generate much profit. As a result, the price of enslaved people was dropping, and the continued growth of slavery seemed in doubt. In England, the invention of the cotton weaving machine led to a huge demand in cotton from America. It had to be painstakingly removed by hand. However, in 1793, a young Yankee school teacher named Eli Whitney came up with a solution to the problem. The cotton gin, a simple mechanised device that efficiently removed the seeds, could be hand powered or on a large scale harnessed to a horse or powered by water. The cotton gin was widely copied and within a few years the south would transition from a dependence on the cultivation of tobacco to that of cotton. There was a slave rebellion in Haiti in 1791, so by 1793 Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act which made it a federal crime to assist an enslaved person trying to escape. September 1850. The Fugitive Slave Law brings the brutality of Southern slavery to the North. Now, no African American is safe anywhere. Gentlemen, you've made a mistake. This is a place of business. I'm a tailor, this is my clients. I'm a free man, I'm not a slave, gentlemen. Fugitive slave law meant that if you were a slave and you managed to escape to the north, your master could come and get you, and you had no recourse. Not only that, if you were a free Negro, they still could sell you down the river. The search for runaway slaves become a witch hunt. Any African American can be condemned simply with an accusation. Even a free man has no right to a trial by jury. Federal magistrates get $10 to rule them slaves, 5 to set them free. The law helped enshrine and legitimize slavery as an enduring American institution. Nat Turner was the first to lead a revolution. He managed to band together a group, the group which eventually numbered around 75 blacks, killed some 60 whites in two days before armed resistance from local whites and the arrival of state militia forces overwhelmed them just outside Jerusalem. Some 100 enslaved people, including innocent bystanders, lost their lives in the struggle. Turner escaped and spent six weeks on the run before he was captured, tried and hanged. From that point on, most states strengthened their codes in order to limit the education, movement and assembly of enslaved people. When Abraham Lincoln won the 1860 election on a platform of halting the expansion of slavery, seven states broke away to form the Confederacy. Shortly afterwards, the Civil War began when Confederate forces attacked the US Army's Fort Sutner. Four additional slave states then seceded after Lincoln requested arms from them to make a retaliation strike. Due to the Union measures, such as the Confiscation Acts, and the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, the war effectively ended slavery even before the institution was banned by constitutional amendment. Following the Union victory in the Civil War, slavery was made illegal in the United States upon the ratification of the 13th Amendment in December 1865. In March 1863, Frederick Douglass issued an emphatic call to African Americans. He wrote, I urge you to fly to arms and smite with death the power that would bury the government and your liberty in the same hopeless grave. African Americans were anxious to join the fight. An act of Congress made it legal. It declared for ever free the soldier that enlisted. So if you enlisted, you were forever free. Also, it said that your mother, your wife, and your children were forever free. 
trading shackles for uniforms, the lash for the gun. At last, African Americans were able to fight for their own people. Deeds of valor, like the 54th Massachusetts famed assault on South Carolina's Fort Wagner, attested to the bravery of African American troops and inspired more to enlist. The Confederates were outraged to find former slaves staring down the barrel of a Yankee gun. As white Southerners gradually re-established civil authority in the former Confederate states in 1865 and 1866, they enacted a series of laws known as the Black Codes, which were designed to restrict free blacks' activity and ensure their availability as a labor force. Impatient with the leniency shown toward the former Confederate states by Andrew Johnson, who became president after Lincoln's assassination in April 1865, so-called radical Republicans in Congress overrode Johnson's veto and passed the Reconstruction Act of 1867. In an attempt to crush the ex-Confederates, the radical Republicans passed the controversial Reconstruction Acts of 1867 over President Johnson's veto. All state governments elected before this time are abolished and new elections are ordered. In these elections, freedmen must be allowed to vote. It is a massive political power play, as the black vote will ensure Republican victories. For most Southerners, the Reconstruction Acts are equivalent to a declaration of war. With Andrew Johnson rendered powerless, the ex-Confederates are now exposed to the unbridled wrath of the Radicals. The following year, the 14th Amendment broadened the definition of citizenship, granting equal protection of the Constitution to people who had been enslaved. Congress required southern states to ratify the 14th Amendment and enact universal male suffrage before they could rejoin the Union. And the state constitutions during those years were the most progressive in the region's history. The 15th Amendment, adopted in 1870, guaranteed that a citizen's right to vote would not be denied on account of race, colour or previous condition or servitude. During the Reconstruction, blacks won election in southern state governments and even to the US Congress. Their growing influence greatly dismayed many white southerners who felt control slipping even further away from them. The white protective societies that arose during this period, the largest of which was the Ku Klux Klan, sought to disenfranchise blacks by using voter fraud and intimidation as well as more extreme violence. By 1885, southern states had laws requiring separate schools for blacks and whites, and by 1900, persons of colour were required to be separate from whites in railroad cars, depots, hotels, theatres, restaurants, barbershops and other establishments. By the 1st of December 1955, an African-American woman named Rosa Parks was riding a city bus in Montgomery, Alabama, when the driver told her to give up her seat to a white man. Parks refused and was arrested for violating the city's racial segregation ordinances, which mandated that blacks sit in the back of public buses and give up their seats for white riders if the front seats were full. Four days after Parks' arrest, an activist organization called the Montgomery Improvement Association, led by a young pastor named Martin Luther King Jr., spearheaded a boycott of the city's municipal bus company. On November 13, 1956, in Brada v. Gale, the US Supreme Court held a lower court's decision declaring the bus company's segregation seating policy unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. On August 28, 1963, some 250,000 people, both black and white, participated in the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom the largest demonstration in the history of the nation's capital and the most significant display of the civil rights movement growing strength. After marching from the Washington Monument, the demonstrators gathered near the Lincoln Memorial, where a number of civil rights leaders addressed the crowd, calling for voting rights, equal employment opportunities for blacks, and an end to racial segregation. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history 
as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And this momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Thanks to the campaign of non-violent resistance championed by Martin Luther King Jr. beginning in the 1950s, the civil rights movement had begun to gain serious momentum in the United States by 1960. That year, John F. Kennedy made passage of the new civil rights legislation, part of his presidential campaign platform. He won more than 70% of the African-American vote. Congress was debating Kennedy's civil rights reform bill when he was killed by an assassin's bullet in Dallas, Texas in November 1963. It was left to Lyndon Johnson, not previously known for his support of civil rights, to push the Civil Rights Act, the most far-reaching act of legislation supporting racial equality in American history, through Congress in June 1964. Mrs. J.D. Milam, and I think this is the most ridiculous thing that has ever happened. The Negroes are just as free as we are. They have the same opportunity to work and to build their part of the town up just the same as we have. I, I just don't understand it and don't approve of it. I'm going to stand up for my rock. Jim Knight with WALB Television News. Mm -hmm. We're soliciting the views of all many people on the Civil Rights Bill. Would you like to give us your views? Well, I think if they remain peaceful, it would be a lot better than perhaps the violence that would be concerned. Uh, well, of course, being a Southerner, I'm not for it at all. I see. And uh, I just don't know how it's going to turn out. I hope we don't have any trouble. We're soliciting opinions on the Civil Rights Bill. Would you like to give us yours? I'm sorry, but I don't think it's the time right now. I think they have equal rights, though. Thank you very much. Would you like to express your views? No, I don't think so. How about you? Nope. What I'd have to say wouldn't be fit to go on air. Thank you very much. I don't like it. I think you're just trying to put something on us that we don't want. 
see. We ought to have a national election on it rather than just letting nine men tell us what we got to do. And how about you? No, I feel the same. Fine, thank you very much. Well, I sure don't like it, that's for sure. I see. Do you feel this will have any effect on your life directly? I imagine it will. Thank you very I'm much. I'm we might have neighbors to live next door to us. At its most basic level, the Act gave the federal government more power to protect citizens against discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sex or national origin. It mandated the desegregation of most public accommodations, including lunch counters, bus depots, parks and swimming pools, and established the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to ensure equal treatment of minorities in the workplace. The Act also guaranteed equal voting rights by removing bias registration requirements and procedures and authorized the U.S. Office of Education to provide aid to assist with schools and desegregation. Some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. <laughs> America is shocked and saddened by the brutal slaying tonight of Dr. Martin Luther King. I ask every citizen to reject the blind violence that has struck Dr. King, who lived by nonviolence. I pray that his family can find comfort in the memory of all he tried to do for the land he loved so well. On April the 4th, 1968, the world was stunned and saddened by the news that the civil rights activist and Nobel Peace Prize winner Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot and killed on the balcony of a motel in Memphis, Tennessee, where he had gone to support a sanitation workers' strike. King's death opened a huge rift between white and black Americans as many blacks saw the killing as a rejection of their vigorous pursuit of equality through the non-violent resistance he had championed. In more than a hundred cities, several days of riots, burning and looting followed his death. The time has come to reaffirm our enduring spirit, to choose our better history, to carry forward that precious gift, that noble idea passed on from generation to generation, the God-given promise that all are equal, all are free, and all deserve a chance to pursue their full measure of happiness. On January the 20th, 2009, Barack Obama was inaugurated as the 44th President of the United States. He is the first African American to hold that office. He did little, however, to address the problem of white police officers using excessive force on the black community. On the 20th of January 2017, Donald Trump was inaugurated after winning an election questioning whether Obama was really an American. It's not a birth certificate, Candy, and people are trying to figure out why isn't he giving his birth certificate. It's not a birth certificate, a certificate of live birth, and you can see that one that you have and the one that I brought you because that's the one that's on the internet and all over the place. It doesn't even have a serial number. It doesn't have a signature. It doesn't have a signature. One that I saw on television has a stamp, but that's not because a signature. It's a pr right, but it's a pr that's how they Excuse do Excuse me, these. but that's not the one that they were showing to everybody. And I just say very simply, why doesn't he show his birth certificate? Why has he spent over $2 million in legal fees to keep this quiet and to keep this silent? When I listened today to the tape of the grandmother and she was saying he was born essentially in Kenya and then all of a sudden, don't forget, this is when Barack Obama was hot as a pistol because it looked like he was going to get the nomination and they had a lot of people and a lot of handlers in there and all of a sudden you hear people all over the room, no, 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 he was born in Hawaii, he was born in Hawaii. But she didn't but they say it was a misinterpretation. They of drowned that. her out. She was like, there were a lot of people in that room. And she said, Kenya, he was born right here. And then they started saying, screaming, no, 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 you mean Hawaii, you mean Hawaii. 46 year old George Floyd died after being handcuffed and pinned to the ground by police officer Derek Chauvin. Chauvin was filmed kneeling on Floyd's neck for more than eight minutes. Floyd had been accused of using a counterfeit $20 bill at a local deli in Minneapolis. 
All four officers involved in the incident were fired and Chauvin was charged with third degree murder and a second degree manslaughter. On May the 26, 2020, the day after Floyd's shooting, protesters in Minneapolis took to the streets to protest Floyd's killing. Police cars were set on fire and officers released tear gas to disperse crowds after months of quarantine and isolation during the global coronavirus pandemic. Protests spread across the country in the following days. To this day, the black community in America is still more likely to be arrested, more likely to be in prison, more likely to be poor, and more likely to die from coronavirus. The most telling evidence being on the 31st of May 2020, when for the first time in a decade, two American astronauts left from American soil to board the ISS. As a country, we're in the midst of a tough week. We're seeing protests, we're seeing a lot of anger, we're seeing violence. And I have to say, this launch and y'all's docking is, is, is a powerful inspiration of what we can do when we come together, of the power of unity, uh, the power of ingenuity. And, and, and so I guess the last question I would ask you is, is, since you have the opportunity to address, in particular, all the young people in America, uh, what would you tell them in terms of what we can do when we can come together? You know, that's a great question. Nine years ago, uh, just about exactly nine years ago, we docked with Atlantis uh, on STS-135, the last flight of the space shuttle program, a 30-year program. And folks at SpaceX, folks at NASA, the commercial crew program put their heads together and worked diligently year after year making sacrifices, working hard, and then nine years later, American launch capability was restored, and this is just one, one effort that we can show for the ages in this dark time that we've had over the past several months uh, to kind of inspire, especially the young people in the United States, to, to reach for these lofty goals and work hard and look what you can accomplish. They mentioned working together. They mentioned the coronavirus. They mentioned having more women in the future moon missions. And yet, amongst all the chaos amongst the George Floyd killings, there is no direct mention of the black community or George Floyd. We will succeed. Our country always wins. That is why I am taking immediate presidential action to stop the violence and restore security and safety in America. I am mobilizing all available federal resources, civilian and military, to stop the rioting and looting, to end the destruction and arson, and to protect the rights of law-abiding Americans, including your Second Amendment rights. This is an issue being ignored in favor of the American dream, the American hero, and even the American flag. They're all being used to disguise and ignore the truth behind all of it. The truth being that the state prefers to protect the white community over the black community. But do you agree with me? Join in the debate below and subscribe.